<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? What a beautiful day. <laughs> it definitely is. Welcome to Step Up for Change. Oh, Alicia, hi. Good morning. You're here. Yay. Everyone's here. I'm going to unmute you. There we go. Let's see how many folks we have. We got folks coming in. Wow, we're so excited about today. We're going to get started right away because we've got a seven people we're going to be chatting with. We've got a great group. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to get right to it because we have this amazing group joining us and this is about their voices. So I'm your co-host Daryl Ann Coles from the Toronto International Design Centre along with Nadine Kalenga, TIBC's Designer Services host. Wave Nadine, hi. Hi. At the hi. Toronto International Design Centre we certainly care very deeply about the industry and the challenges the Black design community faces. I'm still relatively new to the business, but it was apparent to me that we had some work to do in being more diverse and inclusive. We certainly took steps to ensure diversity in our events, but we know that's just one small step. Today we'll hear from seven amazing industry people about their personal experiences in their lives and their businesses. And then we're going to have a group discussion to get at some key core issues. And most importantly, we want to talk ideas that will take us into the future for lasting change. We don't want this just to be our goal at the center is we don't want this just to be a one or two week, you know, um, we call it our muted. We did that ourselves. We wanted this conversation to carry on. I've seen a few industry talks that seem to be playing it a bit safe. So we want today to be open, honest, and of course, respectful. We'd love to hear from you too. Use the chat now and let us know where you're from for our guests that have, are arriving into the session. And throughout the discussion, the questions box is open if you would like to ask questions. Nadine is going to introduce each of our speakers and then we're going to, um, each of them are going to chat a bit about their sort of journey and their experiences. And then we're gonna have the group discussion. So welcome Nadine, good morning. Welcome, good morning everyone. My name is Nadine, I'm the <clears throat> designer service host here at TIDC. And I've been working here for about four years. So I've seen some lovely faces met amazing people so i'm really excited for us to start talking about the changes we can make and uh, my aspirations from this conversation and this talk will just to just see more diversity in our community so i'm just going to introduce all the speakers um their company and then we will dive right into it so first of all, we will start with alicia Roche. she's the interior designer for alicia Roche design co we have Nike O'Neill, she's a designer and creative designer for 800 square feet. Nikki. Have, sorry, Nikki. Sorry, Nikki. <laughs> Nikki, okay. Nikki O'Neill. Sorry about that, Nikki. 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 And then we have Jamelia Francis, she's an interior designer for Francis and Bell Studio. We have Sebastian Clavis, he's a television personality for HDTV, and he's the host. Then next up, we have Anna Lolomari, the interior decorating for Zesty Lifestyle. And then last but not least, we have Brenda Danso. She's an interior designer for BD Interior Design. Um, Alicia is a frequent uh, visitor at the, at the center, working and devoting time to helping the business of design group. She belongs to often setting up meetings at TIDC. Her story on Instagram about Black Lives Matter and her personal story about her son really hit home for us. Welcome, Alicia. Morning, Hi. everyone. Hi, hey, Nadine. <laughs> All right, so tell us a little bit about your experience working as a designer. Yeah so, um, yeah, so thanks so much for having me on the panel uh, and for the, the really nice introduction, Nadine and uh, Darlene. So um, it's really great to be here today and to kind of share my quick story, my journey. Um, so I'm Alicia Sharach. Um, I am a holistic designer um, in Toronto. Um, by looking at me, I am biracial. So my dad is black. Um, so he has roots that's in the West, born in Canada, as well as Barbados. Um, and then my mom is actually white and she's Northern Irish. Um, 
Growing up, I've always loved the interior design industry um, from a young age. As a teenager, whenever I had to help my dad renovate our house, um, so it was, it was pretty much all hands on deck to help kind of tear out um, our entire house and completely rebuild it, um, which was really fun to me and, and got me kind of um, really loving that the design industry. Um, I've watched countless design shows and I'm sure many other people can attest to that they have as well. Um, read a lot of design uh, publications and always would go to the home shows with my parents. So from a young age as a teenager, I've, I've kind of always enjoyed that a lot. Um, I do have an athletic background. So for me, um, I've always played soccer. So I got scholarships offered to the US um, as well as Canada and decided to stay in Canada. Um, unfortunately, at the time, York University did not have an interior design program, um, which was, I was pretty bummed out about. So the next best thing that I wanted to study was health science, um, which people ask, how did I end up getting into health sciences? So that was one of the reasons why. Um, graduating from university, I ended up getting a bachelor's degree, um, and it was actually one of the first um, family members in all of our generations to actually graduate from university. Um, which was pretty huge for my family and something I'm still proud of till this very day as well. So um, moving on from university, I ended up working with uh, Toronto FC as an intern um, in community development, um, worked my way up to coordinator of game presentation. And then fast forward eight years, um, I actually was the sport um, coordinator. So I was involved with uh, managing all of the events out of two of the venues for Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. Um, so BMO Field, Rick Coliseum. Um, I was involved with all of the events from Centennial Classic, NBA All-Star, um, the Pan Am Games, uh, the Grey Cup, and so forth. So I have a lot of experience in events in itself. Um, I've always continued on the side. Uh, my passion for interior design, still uh, trying to keep up with going to design shows and so forth, um, while also pursuing a, um, my career in events itself. Um, and interesting enough, being in this role, uh, when we speak about um, racism, um, I actually, um, I always hold people accountable. I'm always a hard worker. That's how my parents have taught me is always be a hard worker. Nothing's ever handed to you and you need to work for it. And interesting enough, I feel like I'm a pretty outspoken person. Um, it can be very personal, but at the same time, it can be direct. Um, and I'm always accountable and I hold other people to the same um, level as well. And often I would get resistance or pushback or comments about being uh, too emotional, um, being pushy or being too direct. And at the time I did think about whether this was attributed to me being female um, or it was me being uh, biracial or if it was a mixture of both. Um, and even just thinking about that, I usually try to kind of push it aside and keep moving forward because at the end of the day, I don't want that negativity um, to impact me, but it's the very truth that, that we live. Um, at uh, MOSC, I actually uh, was awarded one of the international awards for top 30 under 30. Um, and I was very proud of that and so was my family. And interesting enough, I happened to actually look back yesterday um, to see what all of the other award winners were. And at the time, I'm like, oh yeah, it's a good mixture of females and males. And when I looked at it again, out of 30 recipients um, all over the US and in Canada, uh, only three people were actually black. It was myself, a gentleman, um, and another female, uh, which was really interesting to me. And I said to my head, like, I didn't even notice that at, at many years ago until now, until I actually went back to look at it. So um, again, that was something that was really interesting to me as well. Um, as I mentioned, my parents have always taught me to embrace my heritage. Um, don't worry about my hair being too curly and uh, just carry my way, carry myself the way that I always do. Um, I'm a very passionate person. Um, and I would like to think that now transitioning into the interior design industry that I would be um, represented based off of my work and my merit, not so much um, being judged by the way that I look. Um, and I think that the beauty of interior design is that you can collect different experiences, cultures and aesthetics together to create um, a really amazing space or interior um, and design. And I think that should be the actual focus. Um, it should include different aesthetics and represent different people, which I feel that uh, in the design industry, it's very, 
um, non-representative of Black culture. Um, and I think that a way to move forward would be including being more open. Um, not everyone is specific to a certain type of design um, and just being a lot more inclusive in general, uh, whether that is interior designers, um, artists, or, uh, or makers as well. So again, I think that uh, there can be definitely a lot more inclusive, uh, inclusivity. Um, All right. Let's, sorry? <laughs> All right, we just have other um, other uh, panelists that we have to talk that have to talk through uh, mm -hmm. their experiences, but we'll dive right back into that as well. Okay. Um, next up, we uh, we want to, sorry. Thanks, Nadine. No problem, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today as well. Next up, we have Nikkei. From your discussion, you've been quite the industry, Nikkei. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome. Thank you for having me. Can you, you just want me to introduce myself a little? Yeah, Is that please it? introduce yourself and just give us a little brief um, experience that you have, as, uh, have had as a designer. Um, so I actually, like um, Alicia, uh, studied sciences. So I, I didn't study interior design. I um, My background is Nigerian. I, my Both my parents are Nigerian and growing up, we, like many immigrants, are, you know, you have three choices, doctor, lawyer, engineer. So I decided I was going to be a doctor and uh, studied at the University of Toronto and, and graduated um, uh, with a biotech degree. And on the side, all my electives were always the arts because the way that I describe myself as an artist, that just happens at this moment to, um, whose canvas just happens to be people's home at, homes at this moment. So, um, so after starting um, a blog, uh, a friend pushed me to start a blog, which actually took off and people started asking me to do their homes. And I'm like, well, I'm not a designer. And they're like, well, we don't care. We just like what you're doing. So 10 years later, this is what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. A while back, um, so while I was working in pharma I, and doing design on the side, I ended up working for a pretty prominent design firm. And I, I worked there for about a year and a half and then left to open up um, Canada's first shoppable apartment. So um, for some reason, I took to doing small spaces and that's what I've been focusing on. And when I, when I would go out and look for furniture, I wouldn't really find the items that I was looking for. So I decided I was going to open up this shoppable apartment um, where everything from the furniture to the art to the food in the fridge to the clothes in the closet was all... Um, shoppable and that kind of took off and that um, endeavor led me to doing television um, uh, city line so that's pretty much how I got into design and how I've uh, been able to kind of uh, find my success and I think what has been interesting for me has been uh, being the only in many rooms um, you know from you know when people recognize me most often they they don't remember my name but they'll be like oh that's that black designer on city line so i'm always that black designer <laughs> so that just goes to show if i can be that black designer then that just goes to show that there's not many of us that are visible um so beyond the experience the other experiences that i've had that's generally what uh, i am uh, that's the most prominent thing that i tend to you know that rings clear for me, that black designer. So anyways, I'm Nikki, so thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us, Nikki. So right now, uh, next up, we have Jamelia Francis. Jamelia has a partnership from Relatively New. Good morning, Jamelia. We'd love to hear your journey and how you started your business and how you found such quick success in your business. Um, hi, thanks for having me. Yes, so I have um, a partner. Um, her name's Michelle Bellissimo. So I'm here on the behalf of both of us, on Francis and Bell. Um, I think I'm the youngest here, but um, I graduated from Bachelor's of Interior Design two years ago um, from Humber College. Um, but my journey started in high school. Um, I know a lot of people used to watch HGTV and all that stuff, so that's actually where my journey started. And I was like, oh, I've never seen this before. I never knew that this could be a career path because um, my background is Jamaican and I don't really have any other creatives in my family. You know, as Nikkei said, um, you know, it's either you're a nurse, a doctor, social worker, you know, 
the create like taking a creative path is not really a thing so I was kind of the first in my family to take um, that step. So after watching HGTV, my mom was like, why don't you do some research? So I did some research and I'm like, this is really what I want to do. And it's nothing like it is on TV, but I'm, I'm still very much in love with it. And I've always been a creative person. Um, so I applied for the program. Um, I didn't get in the first time only because I didn't have arts background. So my portfolio, unfortunately, wasn't strong enough, but that wasn't enough to stop me. So I did a program called Design Foundation where you learn all types of design. So architecture, decorating, design, um, industrial, product design, graphic design. So I did all of that and then was able to build a strong portfolio and then reapplied to the BID program and I got in. And um, I actually ended up meeting Michelle in the Design Foundation program. So we met back in 2013. So that's how long we've known each other. Um, and then moving into the design program, it was really hard for me at first, um, being the only, one of the only Black people there. Um, you know, I always felt that as if I stood out, you know, amongst everyone else. And there was a lot of times where I would feel different from everybody and I was treated differently and I'm a very vocal person so I would always express that but nobody would ever really pay attention to it so that's something that I really always um, struggled with um, with the BID program and um, so from there in my third year I had an internship um, doing designing residential spaces in, in the city of Toronto um, and then that's where I learned the bulk of the industry. Um, it was a really good internship. I ended up working there full time. And then unfortunately, a year and a half after my, um, my job, um, they didn't need me anymore. And then that's when Michelle and I kind of connected. And we said, you know, I think this is the time we're young, but we have a good amount of experience. I think we should start something and then that's how my journey started and I'm here a year later. Awesome, thank you for sharing we'll that. for discussion though, Jamelia, you described like how, because that's literally not very long since you've been up and what have you done to be so successful so quickly? Um, well, I would say social media is an, is an important part when it comes to business. And I think a lot of people overlook that. So. Michelle especially has a really strong sense of marketing and advertising. So we've been really pushing that, making sure that we get good content, we're active, we're always in people's faces. So when people see you, they have more of a connection to you, right? So we've been really just trying to push that. And um, yeah, we've just been really focusing on social media and getting a lot of business from there has really helped our company. And our first project was a commercial space. So when you're doing a residential space, it's hard to get a lot of people to see it. But because we did a commercial space, there's thousands of people walking through that space. So it was like immediate attention from there. So, and also the person we designed it for, she's really popular in the city. So it was really easy to get exposure and the space was different. So immediately we just started spiraling from there. So that's how we've been able to find success in just under a year. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so next up we have Sebastian Clovis. Uh, Seb needs no introduction if you're an HI if HGTV fan. His IG videos of late are notably heartfelt and really inspire us to take action. Hi, Sebastian, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, <clears throat> what a difficult moment um, for everybody right now, but I'm really glad that this conversation is is taking place and I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, we'll get into the meat and potatoes a little bit later, but as an introduction to how I came into the industry, um, I'll give you a rundown. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 my father was a high school teacher, but you know, he built so many of the, the things in our house. We came from London, England, we're the only a part of my family that's here. It's only my immediate family that's here in Toronto. And so when we got here, we really had nothing. So my father would take any scrap piece of wood he could find and he built the beds, he built the desks, he built the, my whole house was built of plywood basically. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lot of, 
<laughs> um, um, but you know, that gave me my first uh, my first chance to touch tools, and and of course, you know, being a father's boy, I suppose I'm a mama's boy too. But you know, you I want to emulate my father, and and I just had a magnetic attraction to to building and carpentry, and my parents identified that uh, at at a very young age. Uh, there was really no choice, you know. I was building speed, and I was building little tables. I was building all kinds of stuff. 11, 12, 13 years old. And um, when I turned 14, 15, in around that age, uh, they got a renovation in the house. Uh, they were doing the kitchen. And so they brought in uh, a builder by the name of Nick. He was just a one-man wrecking crew. He did everything himself. He was an older gentleman, around 60 years old, um, master builder, literally did everything. And somehow as a part of that negotiation, they convinced Nick to take me on as the, um, you know, as his, as his I won't even say apprentice, we'll say his gopher, you know, like go for this, that. Um, and so, I, you know, I eagerly jumped onto that and Nick agreed. And so I ended up building that whole kitchen with him. And, and me and this elder, you know, this older gentleman, we just built a rapport. And he saw, I guess he saw something in my eyes that I wanted it. And he ended up hiring me uh, every summer um, um, going forward. So, you know, by the time I graduated high school, I, I had already built kitchens and bathrooms all over the city. And, uh, you know, after high school, I took a year off before I went on my scholarship and built for the entire year. So I had a good, you know, I definitely could hang a window before I could solve for X in algebra, you know? Um, and, and that was my, my first foray into building. Uh, but of course, at that time, I was also into athletics. I was, a, I was an athlete. Um, so, you know, I always say my summers were kind of comprised of, you know, I'd go to work with my tool bag and my little tool kit in one hand and I have my football equipment in my hand. I go to work day in the summer and I would go to football practice in the evening time. And, um, I was very aware, you know, you know, I've always been very aware of, of, of being a biracial child. I don't know. I've always been very aware of racial conflict. I've always been aware of, um, uh, the, the discrimination that happens and the, the way the education system has eliminated a lot of the, the, uh, our culture in order to bias people. And so when I took my scholarship, it, I really didn't take my scholarship based on my athletic career, which was probably dumb. I took it because I wanted to learn something, you know, real. So I took my scholarship to a historically black university. I went all the way down to Mississippi. And if you want to talk about racism, boy, oh, wow. boy. I, I saw it live and it blew me away. The first time I ever saw a chain gang, um, you know, with the prisoners all shackled at the ankles, cleaning on the side of the highway, the cotton fields, it's a different experience. And, um, you know, nonetheless, after a year, I had enough of that particular type of education. Although I did very well, the three point grade point average, you know, I, I finally, I ran track and field, I finalized in a SWAC championship in my career. And uh, it was, it was a good experience for many, many standpoints, but I decided to transfer to St. Mary's University and I got on the championship team over there as an all Canadian, we were repeat champions. I went on to play in the CFL and have a fairly good career over there. When I retired from the CFL, that's when things really got cooking, I suppose, in terms of renovations, because I was, uh, you know, like most athletes trying to figure out what you're gonna do. And so, you know, I bought a small home in the city and I just started renovating. I kind of remember like, oh yeah, I know how to build this kitchen. I'm going to fix this and I'm going to fix the, I'm going to put a skylight and I'm going to build a little addition on the front. And I slowly started to tool up and I slowly started to, to remember that other passion that I had that wasn't athletic. And lo and behold, I had neighbors knocking on the door and they started asking me to do jobs for them. And that's when the light kind of went off and I decided like, okay, this can be a career path. And so I went and got licensed and I started my little construction company and I started working and, 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 and funny enough, it was one of those neighbors who got me into HGTV and it went like this. The, one of my neighbors was working behind the scenes on one of these shows, um, not on the show. It was the lead carpenter behind the scenes. And he had a family emergency that he had to deal with out in Calgary. And so he knocked on the door, you know, knowing that I was a builder and he asked me to take over on that show behind the scenes building. So I did it. And I went over there, and, um, you know, I just, let, I, just, I just let that charisma sparkle, baby. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I showed my build, I showed my build acumen, I showed my carpentry know-how, 
And I think it just got the, the attention of the directors and the producers and everyone just kind of noticed. Plus I was about 210 pounds. You know, I got the long hair, you know, I, I had a, a thing, I had a thing. And, um, but it didn't happen right away, you know, but eyes, eyes kind of turned. Two years later, um, I was talking with a friend of mine who really wanted to get into TV. And I remembered that I had the phone number from a director from that show. And so I called that director the next day and I set up a meeting to help my friend, to connect my friend to the director so that they could get together and, and see what was possible. And lo and behold, that director was just starting a brand new renovation show, um, Disaster DIY Extreme, which was Brian Baumler's old show. Um, but they were revamping it with a new host. And they had a new host in there. They were already filming when I took that meeting. And, um, you know, I took the meeting and, you know, I, it was a good meeting. After the, after the meeting, you know, I went home and I was on my, or uh, the next day I was on my renovation site. And iPhone 1, I think, had just come out. So I did a little video and I, you know, I said something funky on there. Like, you know, um, you know, when I'm on the renovation site, I bring that same energy as the football field, baby. <laughs> <laughs> or something, something to that effect. Nonetheless, he Ooh. ended up putting that on the table of the producers and um, they, they liked the energy. And eight days later, I, that was my show. And, um, and, and, I, and I brought so much energy to it, they ended up changing the name of the show from Disaster DIY Extreme to Tackle My Reno. And that was really my birth into the HGTV fold. And, and I really feel like it's, it's an important thing for me to be there because I'm the only non, you know, everyone else is white. I'm the only person who, who is not. And so I really take that seriously and always try to represent myself with, with dignity and respect and empathy and compassion and skills and humor and all of those things that, that I feel like our people bring to the table. But I, I take that, I put that on my shoulder to always be that person, both on the TV and in my social media, because I know people are, are not just people are looking, but our children are looking. And, and if I'm the only role model that they have to realize like, yeah, I can be a builder, I could get into the design industry, well then I wanna be a good one. And that's what I've tried to be. And that's also why I'm here speaking today because uh, it's important. Awesome, thank you so for, for sharing that experience with us. Um, can you talk a little bit about People of Love, P-O-L? Yeah, uh, I'm so conflicted about that. Um, you know, I, I had, I had, well, some of you have seen my Instagram know that, uh, I had a bit of a mental breakdown, um, when, when I was seeing what was going on as much of a, as many of us did when we were seeing the police beating people the way they were and what was going on. And, and I was really feeling like there was just silence across the influencer community and, and, and it was breaking me up. And I know it was fear. I know people are scared to talk about race because it's so contentious. And you can lose sponsorships and you can turn viewers off, which then in turn will lead to you losing your show. And I'm scared of that too. Um, but there just came this moment when I saw the police beating these two women. And I was on the site. Actually, I was in this house, actually. And I just broke down. And I, and I just said, listen, I don't care. I don't care if... I don't care. You can't be quiet. You can't look at this and be quiet in this moment. And, you know... A lot of people really related to me and, and had their eyes open for the first time to how serious it was because you got big Sebastian Clovis, you know, the, with all the bravado crying. And I think a lot of people just kind of saw that and said, oh, hold on a second. If he's crying, then we need to pay attention. And when I came back around with the next video, um, I, I, again, I always try to lead from love, right? I, I don't want to talk about the problem. I want to talk about the solution. And I want to galvanize people, you know, and... I was just in that video, in that moment, and it's just it, this idea of P.O.L., people of love, popped out because, you know, I see everyone talking about P.O.C.s and non-P.O.C.s, and automatically that conversation splits us apart. And the idea of, of, of P.O.L.s that have both groups in it is way more powerful than either one of those groups combined. And if we could create a group that where people lead with love, then maybe we can take that group and 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 really affect some change. But the only, so now when I say I'm conflicted about the POL thing is also that I don't want people to feel comfortable saying that they're just a POL and therefore they don't have to do anything. Well, I love, 
So, so this doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't want to create a, a, a bridge for people to cross to, to get comfortable when we should all be getting uncomfortable right now. And so that's why, although I love the POL thing, I really haven't pushed it huge because we're not there yet. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing as the all lives matters thing. It's an ideal and it's a beautiful statement. And of course, all lives matter. Asian lives, black lives, indigenous lives, white lives, name me a group of people and I will tell you their lives matter. All of them, you know, but we're not there yet. And so there's work to be done before we can really let that statement ring true, which I hope that one day it will. And the same thing with the POLs. There's still work to be done before we can really qualify ourselves as people of love. We got some issues to address and, yeah. and let's address those first and foremost. And, and if we can lead with love and prove ourselves to be POLs, well then baby, we in a good place. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Uh, next up, we have Iman Stewart. Iman Stewart. Iman has a very interesting background. Hello, Iman. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Nadine? Hi, yeah. everyone. Hope you all are well. <laughs> good. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so um, I am born and raised in Toronto. I grew Grew up in the beaches. Um, my father is a dark skinned black Jamaican man who his roots would probably be West African, but we haven't gotten there yet. My mother is of, she's half German and half French and she grew up out in Saskatchewan. That's where they met. I knew I wanted to be a designer from a little girl because I would spend a lot of time in my room, organizing my room and also creating homes for my dolls. I always thought that Barbie needed a home just in case her and Ken break up, which is the craziest thing because my parents were still married and they still are today. But I just always thought she needs a home. So I'd create her home. I'd do it out of like my armoires. Um, I'd build my own furniture out of cardboard. My mom was more of a creative, very handy. She was a seamstress. She could do a lot of things, but she is a red, she's a nurse. Um, so she kind of helped with that creative side. Uh, and I would create window treatments inside of her leftover fabrics and I would get boxes and create homes. So that was just something I was in, into. I used to watch HGTV a lot as a little girl. And every time I would watch it, I was just so confused as to why nobody looks like myself or my father. They look like my mother, which that's nice, but they, they did not look like my father or me. And I remember being a really young girl. And I said to myself, this, something's not right. Um, I'm going to do this and I'm going to at least represent something different and I'm going to continue to go ahead. Even in school, we had junior achievement come to school and they would show the interior decorator. They didn't have designer, but they had interior decorator making like 20,000 a year. And I remember looking at the doctor's salary and being like, wow, he makes like 400. <laughs> like this is, this is crazy. But I always said, I'll be the designer who can make that money, especially if I want to work hard. And I'm determined. I was the type of kid, if I wanted to do something, I would do it. Um, and you know, my parents at times, but I was very determined. So um, I then went into, I always did the arts, like I was an art student, background always in the arts, art cam. I like to sculpt and do things with my hands more. I wasn't the best at drawing, but I would, I would draw. Um, and yeah, I would work on that. I would hone those, those fundamental art skills. I went to high school now, and I remembered in grade nine, our social worker asking, you know, career day, like, what are you thinking to do? And I remember just looking at the careers and saying, you know what, I'm definitely going to do this as a designer because I don't see any black designers and something has got to change. So it was something in me that sparked young. And then I started taking on my art classes and uh, then went to school. I went to Fanshawe College in London, Ontario. I did want to go to Humber, like Jamelia. <laughs> I really wanted to go to that school, but they actually had a very uh, strict portfolio process. And when I saw that, I said, I'm going to London, Ontario, where they're not going to give me such a hard time because I got a deadline. I got to get out. I want to graduate by 21 and start my business, right? So I, I worked in, in the industry and I, again, would not notice anybody that kind of looked like me. Working with old, older white men, construction kind of businesses, I worked, you would see that they were attracted to me because I maybe don't look like like a white woman and I might not look like a black woman. So you could tell there was that there, but I was always very professional. I was, I'm fun. I have a good 
personality, but I was always very professional, but very conscious of, okay, there's no one else out there that looks like me, but I was just kind of determined into making my own path and carving out my own way and starting my business. My, I, I don't know in terms of like my real success, but I've had my business for the past five years and I do everything from commercial to residential design. And, um, it's, it's a joy, but it's also some something that I can see needs to be a change because not only was I young, I was a woman and black. So I just saw that there was three layers of this. It's, it wasn't just, you know what I mean? It sometimes felt kind of uncomfortable, but again, you just push forward. And today is the day that I think it's great to start this discussion because we have to come together. We all have different backgrounds. We all have, but there's a similarity and we've all felt that, you know, something's kind of off here. So this is more than the best time to speak about this type of thing. I hope I've kind of introduced myself well. <laughs> yeah, no, you did great. Thank you, Anna, for sharing. Uh, sorry, thank you, Iman, for sharing. Next up, we have Anna and she's new to Toronto and has lived and transformed her business more than once. Um, welcome, Anna. Tell us about your experience here in Toronto as compared to uh, Houston. Okay, um, so I'm Anna, <laughs> both my parents are Nigerians, and uh, I, it's, it's so funny, I started my interior decorating lifestyle in Calgary, Canada, and uh, I worked with a custom home builder, that's where I got my main experience from, um, I did some certifications, like Nika said, our culture in Nigeria, we were not allowed to do creative arts, it was more, my parents were like, you have to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. So I ended up doing BSc in economics. And on coming, finding my way to Canada, I decided I wanted to go back to what I really love to do, which is creative arts. So while I was having my little babies, I have three kids in Calgary. I was doing certifications online in interior decorating and refinements. I also worked with Laurie Ward. I went to New York and got my certification in interior refinement. I had an opportunity to um, do some interior decorating projects while we were in New York. I also, then I worked with a builder in Calgary for three years as the interior selections designer and also a stager. And after three years with this company, I decided to start my own company, which is Zest Interiors. So what I was doing was um, interior decorating, interior refinement, staging. And in terms of networking, it was really my neighbors. And what inspired me was HDTV like everybody else. And my neighbors were coming to my home and like, Anna, how do you just pop color? How do you bring in all this eclecticness? And that was how um, through that I started having clients from neighbors to neighbors' friends. And that is how I built up my portfolio. I joined house.com house and I started getting clients through house.com from referrals and re references as well. And um, during this time, we had to move abroad for eight years. So I lived in China for four years. And during my time in China, I did a lot of travel. I um, also did most of the design um, events out there in China, the trade shows. And then after that, I moved to Houston, Texas. And Houston, Texas was an eye opener for me. Um, I was doing remodeling projects in Houston, Texas through my private network as well. So um, private clients, remodeling homes. Um, it was tough. America compared to Toronto, I've just been here in Toronto for 15 months, but I find that in America, it was much more fun and warm, I guess, because I'm, I was just not the minority. So wherever you go for trade shows, you see other black people, but we were still the minority. But what I found in the US that was more pleasant, that people were more pleasant in the decorative center, wherever you go to compared to here, I've gotten more coldness here in Toronto um, since I arrived 15 months ago. Um, I now decide, I now, I lived in Houston for five years and decided to move to Toronto um, because my kids are here in Ontario in boarding school. And on coming here, I decided to do more decorating and not necessarily remodeling homes. So 
right now I'm working with more urban living, so condos, small spaces. And how have I been networking myself, to be honest with you? Social media has been awesome for me. I have no family here in Toronto at all. I did the first um, Toronto design um, show this January that happened here. And what I found was a lot of people were cold. I, I mean, you walk in and the question you've been asked is, oh, are you a designer? Um, and I, I, I say to myself, if I wasn't in the creative field, I wouldn't be here in the first place. And I'm wearing a badge that shows my company saying Zesty Lifestyle. And people are still asking me, are you a decorator or a designer? The boots were cold. I didn't see a huge representative of a lot of a lot of brands and also I thought that everything was more one-sided I saw a lot of segregation um, so that was my first experience that threw me off and I must tell you all I left after two hours of being at the interior design show because I just felt if I'm not welcome, then why am I here? So um, <laughs> what was the next thing? Uh, I realized also that in the design industry, it's more about referrals and more networking than anything else. Um, oh my God, sorry. Are you there? Yes. We can hear you. Can you see me? Um, over the years, networking through my personal networking groups has, has, given, has been the one that's given me success. Um, um, personally, I've not allowed the ignorance of people to deter what I love to do. I just shared with Nadine and during last week, I walked into EQ Furniture. This, this is a typical case. And I was already judged from the time I got to the door that I couldn't afford it. Um, and I think that needs to stop. I mean, don't judge people by color. Don't judge people by, even if they are wearing slippers or even they are wearing sneakers, because you never know who they are. Yeah. So this, and how do I call, and what I do, I always, I'm very bold and outspoken. So I called it to action immediately. I did share this in my stories yesterday. And I did call the manager to say, this is not, this is not the way it should be. You know, I was out there to pick an item and I just, I called my client and I said, I'm not, we're not shopping here anymore. I didn't feel welcome. Nobody approached me to say, hi, how may we help you? And I think we need to erase that, you know, that thing of color because in the creative world it's not about color, but about our skills and what we love to do, the passion we love to do. So I'm hoping that um, these are things we're going to discuss and find solutions. And I think there should be some kind of inclusion. Like I said, we're not included in, I mean, you turn on HDTV, we're the minority. You open the magazines, there's no one there. There's no diversity in the magazines. And I think things like that needs to change. I am new to Toronto, so I don't really have um, you all are my new network. <laughs> so um, we're your new been, family. <laughs> you are my new family. I've uh, I've just been working with House.com since I arrived. Um, actually, House.com approached me this year to say a lot of my services is needed here, especially for small condos. So I've been getting projects through House.com, and um, I'm hoping that it would get better as the days go by. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I can't wait to start talking about the solutions. But before we do that, let's talk to Brenda. Brenda um, is taking great strides in the, in the industry. Um, Brenda, tell us what's happening for you. We know you have a lot going on. Tell us more about that. <laughs> a lot is an understatement, Nadine. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'll, I'll go 
I think a little bit of, into my background, but not too much, but um, I'm originally from Ghana. I migrated to California at the age of five, so I grew up in LA. Um, I moved to Toronto. It's been eight years now since I moved to Toronto. I have uh, professionally, my background started in corrections, so I worked at a correctional facility in, um, in LA. And so when it comes to systemic issues around race, um, I think that's nothing new for me because of a lot of the things that I've seen based on my background. Um, I think when I moved to Toronto, I started my, my business in staging in 2017. I was really drawn to um, staging and the art of preparing a home for sale. Um, so through starting my staging business and later on expanded into design as I started to get design clients and I really expanded my team um, to build what I have today. Um, I think in terms of experience around racism, I can't say that I've experienced racism in the design field. I want to focus more on the bias and implicit bias that really occurs, um, similar to some of the examples that Anna gave. And I think for me, um, well, in the beginning, I should say, as I try to intern and avail my services to so like even shadow and things like that in the beginning of my design career. Um, I got a lot of no's, I can't say why. Um, and so when I started my business, it was really intentional for me to make sure that I took on interns, um, visible minorities, uh, namely, just because I knew that there was a problem that existed. Um, and so it wasn't really through my conversations and my experience with my interns where they talked about some of the things that Anna has highlighted and that really caused me to kind of reflect on some of my experiences and realize, you know, you know, there's that implicit bias that we often experience. And sometimes, unfortunately, as a visible minority, it's become part of our norm, unfortunately, that we kind of overlook it until we have these conversations. And so through conversations with interns talking about their experience in the showroom and not really feeling welcomed, or their experience um, going to trade shows and not feeling welcome. It really prompted me to, again, be really intentional about how I run my business and how I make sure that it's diverse. Um, and so that's really spearheaded some of the work that I've started doing prior to this wave that's happened a few weeks ago because of, again, um, my understanding that this issue exists and so as I run my design business, again, I think I'm really intentional about how I do it. Um, I have my master's in social work, so I have a really strong mental health background. And I think that really drives the way that I run my design business as well. Awesome. And you also launched um, Black Canadian Interior Designers. Can you tell us about that platform as well? <laughs> yeah, so it's funny because Iman Stewart, who's also on the panel, um, you know, I've had, when I first started, I. I you know, looked at the representation there. I didn't really see anyone that looked like me. And so I started actively searching for designers who were black in Canada. It led me to a lot of um, African-American designers in the US. And so over the course of the three years, I probably found maybe five designers who were black. And I was really intentional about that because again, the representation was not there. So even for about four months ago, Iman and I talked about just starting this network um, because it's interesting that we have the topic about Black Canadian designers. We're all designers, right? There shouldn't be that, um, that shouldn't be highlighted. But the reason why it is, is because there isn't that representation. So one of the reasons why Iman and I wanted to start that initiative is to just connect um, designers with other designers who look like them because what I was finding out and what I've also experienced is that through this journey, it can be lonely or feel lonely um, and uncomfortable sometimes. And it's not so easy to have those conversations about race and the bias that you experience with people who don't look like you because, you know, they can't relate, right? And so that conversation ends up being an education, which is also okay, but it's nice to really, you know, be able to speak with people who are experiencing the same thing as you so they can provide that support. So I'm happy that we started that initiative because it's really highlighted that there are black designers um, in Toronto or in Canada, because I think that was like the question when this whole wave started, they, people started turning around like, hey, we're all the black designers, right? Um, and I think that I hope that we can move away from that conversation to where there is representation and we wouldn't be asking that question. Mm -hmm. 
That is an amazing end goal. Let's work towards that. <laughs> Thank you everyone for sharing your stories. We, um, I, they're all amazing stories. We have 10 minutes left. We would, should have obviously made this much longer and we can go over. I just don't know how, you know, if those folks who have to go, um, but we have a special guest. We had some key topics to discuss, to come up with ideas, but we've had a special guest pop up in the chat. Angela Jennings, she's the executive producer for a production company that produces shows for HGTV. In fact, her development team has reached out to some of um, you probably on the panel already. They're working to change things on air and behind the scenes and would love your feedback today of what's missing on HGTV beyond on air talent. I'd love, she'd love to hear your viewpoints and how we can be more inclusive and representative on air. Any thoughts? I think, you know, outside of the design industry, it's really a societal issue. I know um, what we have to look at is really like who are the key stakeholders and not just the design field, but in all organizations, right? Because I think when we look at the root of the issue, that's really, you know, what it stems down to. So I think representation in all areas, not just on screen, but also the decision makers and those who are recruiting, right? Um, what lens are they doing that from, right? Are they being intentional about making sure that there's diversity um, in the viewing or again, in the decision making and things like that to make sure that also the designs that we see looks different because we know that we know what the Eurocentric design looks like, but when it comes to, um, I know what we're labeling as global inspired, but when we look at really um, incorporating African pieces or just diverse pieces into design and um, look of design. I think that is lacking in HGTV where most of the designs really, like we're familiar with it, but there's so much more out there in terms of representing other cultures um, and other aspects of design as well. Right. And, and I think that's a good, what Brenda says, it's a good, it's a good reflection of Canada how many cultures, like who's really Canadian? Like Canada is 150 years old, 150 something years old. We, when you look in Toronto, when you, there's so many different cultures. And especially when you're talking about people of color, black people, you're downtown Toronto, you're the Jamaican person's right by the Ghanaian person, Nigerian. There's so much culture. There, it should be more properly represented on HGTV, especially HGTV Canada. I, I totally... In line with Brenda and Iman, I totally also agree with that. I think there should be more diversity on the screen. I mean, and also for our young viewers too, the upcoming designers and decorators, because I have, I've seen teenagers I talk to with my kids, they're like, oh, but we don't see, we don't see diversity on HDTV, so I don't want to go, like my daughter would say to me, you know, mom, I'm not going to do interior decorating or design. I'd rather do something else because we're not well represented represented on, on, on air. So I think that's something HDTV should look at is share more creatives out there. And also I know there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of design from Southeast Asia, from Africa, from what have you, so that can be aired. And I think we need to see more of that on the Canadian network because that represents the Canadian people as well, the Canadian diversity as well. Right, right. I and think I can very quickly say as the one person here who's who's actually on HGTV, I can say that um, HGTV is is I don't want people to look at HGTV as the enemy because I, I really do know they've been very supportive of me um, uh, throughout my entire career and I know they have been trying to find uh, um, designers and builders of other ethnicities. Now, whether or not those castings are going to the right places and they're actually being successful in doing it, well, I mean, you can look at the TV and see that the success is not there yet. But I know that the, the door is open and I know that they are very welcoming to, to, to this conversation in particular. Right. And I think that everybody who's on this panel should be very excited in this moment because we're all gonna be getting I think a few more eyes on us and a few more opportunities. And I, I know for a fact that these conversations are happening within HGTV. And um, if, if there's a moment to strike, brothers and sisters. Now. <laughs> right now. Nice. 
I think what Amalia talked about too, when we chatted with her was about mindset too, is, you know, she's just going for it. You know, remember how we talked about that, Jamalia? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of HGTV, HGTV as well, um, it would also be nice to see diversity within H, because I know um, a lot of people on the show are, are older, and, you know, it'd be a lot easier for people in my generation to connect to them as well if we saw other people of our age. And, you know, Anna, as you mentioned, your daughter not wanting to go into decorating. You know, that's really sad to hear that as well, because that's part of the reason that I wanted to even have a business and have a platform, because I want other Black women to mm -hmm. look at me and say, I can do it too. And that's the reason why I've been so vocal, like my whole entire career, every time in school, because I want people to see like, okay, she's doing it. How did she do it? How can I get there? And I think that, you know, Brenda creating this whole um, collective so other people can see us is, is really good because there's little to no representation and it's very, it could be discouraging. Like, especially, yeah, especially as a young black woman, like even finding a job and I, like, I love my internship, but it took me 300 applications to even get there. And I ended up finding that job on Facebook. So I didn't even get that internship through an application. It was something that I had to seek out. And all of my other counterparts were getting internships from professors and from just straight nepotism. And I had to take that extra mile to even get there. So there's a lot of work to be done. But yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you, Jamalia. Anyone else? Are we going to be able to continue the conversation? Because I'd really like us to dive into like yeah. the meat of things. Yes. Yeah. I know, I know you said we only have 10 minutes left. Let's go. Okay. Uh, let's get into it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I wasn't sure if people had to leave, but I would really like us to kind of jump into it, you know? Yeah. I mean, miss what you want. I, I do have, I got, I got wallpaper. I got to install it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. All right, Seb. Anyone who has to go, please don't feel. But we'll be uh, connecting back afterwards and following up with everyone. But before before I go, I, I do want to say um, to everybody on this panel and everybody who's watching, who's in the de de design and construction industry, I think it's very important for us all to connect with each other outside of this conversation and 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 get each other's contacts and um, and support. You know, because the first people who are going to support us is us. And, and the more people see how, how beautiful our designs are and how good our work is, um, you know, the better it's going to be. So, so please hit me up on Instagram in, in the DMs or whatever, you know, slide in them DMs and <laughs> whatever, just so we can, we can connect. If you have any questions you want to ask me, um, you got to absolutely feel free that I am here. I answer to everybody's questions on. I got so many conversations going on in my DMs with strangers right now. I really do engage and uh, I'm not afraid to speak. So, um, so hit me up, hit me up. Uh, so before you go, there was someone that asked, how does one get into contact with HGTV? Um, well, that's a hard one to answer. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that the way you, the way things generally happen is that you get in touch with a production company and the production companies get in touch with HGTV because they're aware of what shows are coming up and uh and what needs to be casted um but that being said you know you got to go on hgtv.ca and look at the casting calls all the times because they're out there you know th that's where they post them they might you might not see them in, in in the places where you generally always look but if you go to hgtv.ca there's casting calls all the time and there is email um emails that you can send you know your resume or your portfolio and what i would say as a as a go-getter is hey just put together a little two minute three minute tape tell them who you are tell them you love the channel and that you would like to be a part of it. And I think that, um, I think at least somebody is gonna pick that information up and they're gonna have it in their, their pile of, um, of prospective people that they can bring onto the channel when that time comes available. So hgtv.ca, I believe it's backslash casting calls or just contact, that's how you can do it. Just take the shot, send the email. Hey, you don't shoot, you don't score. 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. And you also got a big shout out from um, from the from Angela Jennings too. She said, "Love it. Thank you all, and thanks, Sebastian." Thank you, Sam. I'll see you later. Um, good luck, and let's be strong in this moment. Um, and and hope that and hope that, that finally we, we are heard and 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 we are seen for who we really are. A beautiful people. Yes. Thank thanks, you. Sam. Thanks, all right. Sam. See you later. Happy install. And uh, Michelle Hurley, she said, as a white designer, how can I help to create a bridge to your designer group and um, young uh, people of color? Did anybody want to uh, answer that? Um, I kind of spoke about this um, in a video and, and also with my business partner. I think that it starts with the hiring. So actually hiring yeah other black people actually hiring minorities, like starting from there. And also it starts from, from school because even though I was, I was fortunate to know what I want to do and everything and do my research, I did not have the support from the, the educational system. The support was only thankfully coming from my parents, you know? So I had to do the research. I had to see what electives I needed to take. I had to, and I know that's on me, but like, there's no support within the school system. And like some of my other friends who went to certain schools or live in certain areas, they were able to take AutoCAD classes or SketchUp classes or Photoshop classes. And it wasn't offered um, to me in school. So I think we can bridge the gap by, you know, implementing programs and workshops to teach other black people, like from the time they're in high school, how to do certain things, what they need to do to apply to um, design programs, um, what kind of programs they need to learn, just everything about the business, the industry. I think it starts from young. And that's kind of how we have to start to change the whole conversation and change the dynamic of the industry. It's starting from the time that people are in high school and kind of bridge that gap there. Attracting even creatives into it. Yeah, because... Well especially black men i know we talk a lot about a black woman but black men don't they don't have that that encouragement either so it's it's really hard we need a lot more black men too to bring in diversity and a male perspective when it comes to design like i think we're really lacking when it comes to black men especially yes michael lambie's uh one of the attendees and he's often at our center as well he's um actually brought that up he said the panels even our panel is all women as well um, and he would love to be part of this chat next time so anyone else where do we want to start then we talked about we want to start at the root i think am i on mute no no <laughs> okay i think i think one of the themes that i hear in a lot of us um when we gave our introduction is um, our parents and how um, for us, it's been um, because our parents, most of which are immigrants, they kind of have this set belief that we can only be successful in these certain um, avenues and they rarely include the arts. So I think, although we talk about the, um, the fact that we're not included or we are um, discriminated on or there's stereotyping and all these sort of things are profiling. I think that's a huge thing because it, it has to start with us as well. I think there's a lot of different conversations and changes that are happening, but I think that also needs to be something that we look at in terms of the fact that um, it's not something that's encouraged. The arts are not looked at as something that we can, that you can, uh, be successful or sustain sustain yourself with. So I think it's important as we, uh, you know, raise children um, and mentor people, I think it's important that we um, show that the arts is something that we can become successful. And I think it's difficult because that it, everything is connected and everything affects each other. I mean, Perhaps if there was more representation, perhaps if we seen if if we were seen a lot more, then that would be something that would allow um, and let people know that you can be successful in the arts as a as a black person or a person of color. Um, 
so I think it's, it's tough because when you talk about roots, there, I, it, I feel like there are many, <laughs> uh, perhaps in the home, but um, also systemic as well. So it's, it's a difficult question to know where that root is, but I think as um, in terms of what we can affect and how we can affect change just in our own personal lives, I think as we, as we raise children, you know, encouraging them um, in the areas that they want to pursue and not just in these areas that have traditionally been the successful ones. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And ideas of how we can address that as a group. I, as a I think government, education, you know, is what's going through my head. Education, um, making these industries more attractive or even at the arts at a young age. You see that in a lot of schools, that's the first thing to go. Music, arts, I've certainly that's seen that in my own daughter's school. And um, my daughter went through an uh, art school even, and I'm largely segregated there as well. So there is, you know, it's hard to pinpoint, as you say, but is there action that we can support? You know, maybe it's through the associations and or the educational institutions they you know to uh, approach them absolutely i think that um i think that's i think that would be huge it's it's kind of like what um the U utm university of toronto mississauga campus they had an initiative where they um essentially put out a call for people who wanted to apply for their medical school program that were black people and this year i think they have like 21 because they, they literally had no black doctors so i think it's one of these sort of things where we would have to work with schools or mm -hmm. high schools or, or colleges to perhaps see if there is an initiative that we can put out to encourage people and let them know hey you, you know you're we are here and we you are wanted here you know mm -hmm. I think because, more and more for example i saw this morning a post from arido talking about their commitment to diversity and inclusion. So that, you know, those are the places to start, those who are being more um, vocal and taking a, a position on it. Those are the ones that are open to it. And so let's start there. And TIDC is happy to support in, in any way as well that we can. No, and I was going to say, because it is a societal issue, I think that we all within our roles have to really assess to see what it is that we can do, right? So if you are putting together a panel discussion, right, it's really being intentional around um, what that panel looks like, right? If you are holding a trade show, really looking at what that representation looks like. Um, if you have a showroom, right, how welcoming is your showroom? Because it's, you know, I think we can say uh, there are a lot of people who are not racist, but when it comes to that bias, we don't really realize that we're demonstrating that unless we really reflect, right? So I think it's really the onus is on all of us because it is a societal issue to really assess to see how we can affect that change, right? So if I'm looking at my business, I'm looking at, you know, the interns and who I give opportunity to making sure that's diverse, right? Or within my role, what I can do. So I think if we all did that, um, that would definitely be a start, even in terms of marginalized communities when, you know, going to schools and just showing yourself as a designer um, or talking yeah. about what that industry looks like or can look like is motivating to that youth who didn't even know that interior design um, exists, right? Because we'll be surprised yeah. to hear about youth who are in these communities who don't even know that this is a, a field that they can um, go into because they don't have that exposure. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work that could be done, but if we just look at the stakeholders, um, we can't affect as much change versus just looking at ourselves individually and looking at what we can do. Absolutely. I also think more collaborations within ourselves too would also help. Absolutely. Um, yeah, within the Black creatives as well. And we see our role at the center as, you know, we're, we're more on the, our space is for the most part dedicated to showrooms and, you know, we're looking at that as well. So for example, we have a marketplace that we're starting up again that is dedicated to startup companies and um, 
more mature businesses as well that just don't want to commit to that full showroom and prefer more of a community space. So one idea we had is to um, have sort of a scholarship, if you will, of a, or either a young startup or a company that's black owned um, to be in that space as well we're launching in august so we'll be you know thinking more about that and promoting that in the very near future i like think it's a good idea much more conscious of that and and doing that amazing i think that's a good idea and what i would say is like even with with the marketplace or reaching out to younger students going into schools and whatnot mm -hmm. helping them understand the business behind it because just like the the panelists speaking here today their parents our parents might not think we can make money in a creative field but if you have a bit everything has a business behind it exactly. so if there's a business sense that's taught you know um corporation versus uh, sole proprietorship corporations canada filings every year like people one. need to know these things like yeah totally. Yeah, like, so I'm just, I'm just saying it might be an idea to reach out to high schools and to elementary schools and also let them know, know a little bit about running the business, the design business or the construction business and kind of giving um, students and younger people that knowledge. And maybe it could be integrated within the marketplace and integrated within the Toronto International Design Centre. And I would always be willing to come out and especially speaking to students. That's something I've always done. I've gone back to my high school. Um, I've, I've, we visit schools. My husband does school tours. He's a musician. So we, we are very connected with youth and going into schools. And I'm pretty sure all the other panelists wouldn't mind, um, you know, um, giving their, their time towards something like that. So I think that's a good idea. Yes, we actually always do an annual event uh, for student tours for more, the majority of the schools. Um, and we do a big one for Georgian because they're quite a distance. We do a full day and we had a group of designers speak to them this year for the first time. So we'll continue that on as well. And one guess, of them was actually Christine. Sorry, go ahead, Emma. Oh, no, I was just saying also like looking at the areas because I can say that I went to an, I had a great art program but I went to school kind of in the beaches I wasn't in a predominantly black area growing up in Toronto right I don't know what the program was with at, in Mar Moss Park and in, in Flemington Park like I don't know what those art programs were right so my maybe reaching out to even those schools um, in those areas that's a great idea one of the other things that I wanted to touch on before we move away from schools is that what's also being taught in schools I think the curriculum itself is always is also very Eurocentric. You don't see a lot of things you, like there's no design African design class. You know that's not a class. Because, you know a sec a section or a chapter in the book. You know, so I feel like um, there needs to be diversification across the entire board. It's that's why it's hard to kind of figure out where you start, right? I guess we start somewhere, but I think being able to learn that so that we can, I mean, so that we have an array of different types of styles that you can choose from that you can understand. Um, right. Because there is, there is design and there is um, um, something to be celebrated um, with African architecture. I don't even think it, most people don't even know what to think about when you say African architecture, people, what does that look like? A hut, you know, like, no, you know, there, there are things that should be taught and sorry, I'm getting passionate. This is what this is what happens when I start getting fired up. <laughs> but um, but I think that the, the curriculum itself needs to diversify. You know. Yeah, I agree because when I was in school, it was like we did art history. You see Egypt, you see the columns, and then all of a sudden, it's just Greek columns and Roman columns. And I'm like, well, what what else? How, how long was Egypt ruling for? And like, let's look at the different they designed different type of capital systems that you see around each pillar. It's not just Doric and Corinthian style. It goes back to the right. Acanthus leaves mm -hmm. that was in, um, uh, in the Nile, like in, Afri in Africa, right? So it's, it's true in the textbooks and what they're teaching. So it's, it's not a narrative for everybody. You know, it's, it's, we need to be better. Yeah. And then 100%. when you step out of this, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say a comment from Janelle Morel, who is a designer at our center as well. It, always there with uh, Melissa Tossel. She says, uh, when Ryerson School of Interior Design had career night for 
portfolio reviews or year end shows, seeing any one of you would have been amazing. So to me, that speaks to like, why aren't, aren't you there, right? You guys got to DM me. You got to slide in the DMs. <laughs> if we if we know about it, then we'd be we'd be there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the yeah, when... inclusion issue. Inclusion, Inclu yeah. inclusion, exactly. One yeah. last thing I did want to mention. I know we want to get off the school topic, but something that's even more deeply rooted in the educational system, I think, is the grading quota. And this is something that we don't, like a lot of people don't even know about or don't want to talk about is, you know, a lot of times minority students, they fall into the lower end of the grading quota. And it's so, it's so obvious, like, especially being the only black person in the program, how I fall victim to the grading quota, even just, you know, not like, doing a project and it being just as good as everyone else, but still getting a lower B, a lower C. And it's like, I've, I've experimented with this where, okay, I'm gonna approach this project and I'm not gonna try. Or you know what, I'm gonna try 10 times harder. And it's like, or even just being mediocre and still falling victim to the same exact grades. That's something, first of all, we need more black professors. And secondly, a lot of the professors need to check their bias. And I've had to fight for marks every single year of my program. I've had to address the dean. I've had to address my profs and say, why is it that I'm doing 10 times more work yeah. and receiving the exact same grade? So we need to address this yeah. with the school system and say, even from high school, but specifically talking about design school, that's something that we need to address because I shouldn't have to fight every time I'm handing in a project especially when I know that I've worked day in and day out to make sure that it's good. So I think that's something that, that needs to change because it kills your confidence. It kills your confidence as, as a black woman, as a designer, just everything about it. Just stri I've had times where I've broken down at school in the bathroom, just saying like, you know, I, can I do this? I'm not meant for this. I'm not creative enough. I'm not good enough because insightly that's what the professors are telling you you're not good enough and that's that's how they start to weed out certain people because from the time you from year one to year four the numbers drop and and most often times it's the minorities that drop because they were weeded out so i think that's something that needs to be heavily addressed as well because it's it's discouraging if i wasn't such a strong person i don't know if i'd be here yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Amelia, because I've spoken to multiple interns who are not just Black, but of visible minority, and it's so sad because this is this, the story that you're sharing is exact, um, and so I commend you for your resiliency um, because they also spoke about the students who didn't make it because they got tired and dropped out, or they just kind of gave up and just continued to hand in mediocre work and just got out of the program and then their story or that narrative continued um, when they were not validated or acknowledged outside, like when they finished a program. And so it just continued. So it's really, I think for me, that's been more of the eye-opening experience because in my journey, I walked alone. Um, and so now working with other visible minorities in terms of internship or hiring and things like that, I'm hearing more of these stories and it's really heartbreaking because then that also affects the numbers of black designers or visible minorities that then move into where we are right now. So I think that um, it's happening, but unfortunately um, these people are not sharing their stories because they're not comfortable to do that. Um, so yeah. thank you for bringing that up and highlighting that. Mm -hmm. I think it's tough because all of us here have made have reached some sort of success so you would assume that we are all we all have some element of strength and i think that's always um commended and you always get this pat on your back like oh you're so strong but that as a black person and forget designer just as a black person that's something that we have to kind of that resilience um i think is is something that we all um we carry and it's heavy it's heavy, like it's heavy to be resilient. It's heavy to be strong. And I'm not saying that everybody doesn't have their things that they go through. I'm talking about all different 
nationalities, but it's something that we carry. And I think there's something to be said about, um, because I, I, when I'm hearing, when I'm listening to people talking, most of the time when you have these sort of conversations and you're having it with somebody that is not black, that can't relate, um, immediately they go to, perhaps the work is not good enough. Perhaps, um, then these sort of, this verbiage starts where you start now excusing these sort of things. Um, and I, and I feel like people slip through the cracks because they're not resilient. Those are the ones that you, they're not the Nikki's and the Jamelia's and the uh, Alicia's and the, you know, um, Brenda's that end up because they slip through the crack, cracks. And I feel like, um, our narrative sometimes has to change where we're not just leading with strength, but also empathy and also, um, support. I don't know. I just, I feel like this, uh, um, attraction or this um what's the word i'm looking for uh obsession almost and i know it sounds strange so what i'm going to say sounds strange but this obsession with strength i think we need to have an obsession with compassion an obsession yeah. with empathy because not everybody is strong not everybody can just be like oh let me just do this on my own let me just you know like i i'm tired you know i'm successful to a certain degree and i'm exhausted you know like you walk into a showroom and somebody's looking at you sideways because you think you're going to carry a couch out with like, you know, <laughs> or they don't want to, they don't want to help you or, you know, there's so many microaggressions and it's great that we can just barrel through and be strong. But at some point that begins to wear. And I feel like um, when we talk about the young right. people and people that are going into schools, there needs to be a sense of handholding. And I know we always push forward and be like, no, you know, get, pull up your bootstraps and do it on your own. I think that th that way of thinking needs to be, um, rethought. Um, and I think support is, sorry, again, with my ranting when I get passionate about something, but I think that idea of always being strong and just barreling through is something that we need to rethink because it, it's not necessarily, um, the best way to go forward. And I think it's a very masculine way of thinking, which is what we're used to. And I think there does need to be a little bit of that feminine energy that we start instilling into everything, not just design but just in general the way that we approach certain things i do think needs to have that element of feminine in it not everybody can just barrel through you know so just my just two to add on that i also <laughs> wanted to mention like for it like you said a lot of african parents always focus on engineering lawyer as an african myself that's how my parents are so for a design student who has parents like that who discouraging the arts already and they step into an industry where they're not supported i can just imagine that strength is already lowering every time right on top of that you adding the teachers who are marking them differently from their other peers is even tougher so that's that's a great point to add as well and you're getting where i can, can barely keep up to the comments because i get <laughs> lots of support and love for you um amens and <laughs> Um, we have an interesting question from Josh McIver. He was a student, started with us as a student a few years back. He's now a visual merchandiser out of Sheridan. He says he would love to know how designers can include non-neurocentric design aesthetics in a way that is respectful and not cultural appropriation. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Beautiful. He's brilliant. I, I can jump on this, but I don't want to be the only one like talking. So if anybody wants to go, then go ahead. But I can, I don't mind. No, go ahead. If you have a thought, share. I think the issue with cultural appropriation has to do with um, giving credit to the source. So a lot of times you'll see where you have um, individuals that will take something that is um, integral or that comes from a particular culture and then put it out there as though it was theirs, as though they yes. came up with it, as though it had no roots um, anywhere. So I think when it, the idea of cultural appropriation is a tricky one because yes, everybody has, every, and nothing is new and we're all inspired by things and that's great, but I think there is something to be said because of the situation that we're in where we are often not seen, black people are often not seen and heard and our um, culture ideas um, are not appreciated or celebrated. When a person, um, when a non-black person takes something and puts it out there and 
begins to receive, you know, praise for that thing, that's where the pain comes from. Where when, when we've been doing it all along, then all of a sudden somebody comes out there. So I think when it comes to um, including these sort of um, non-Eurocentric or African-inspired designs, I think in just in some way, you step coming from a place of celebration, as opposed to um, and making sure that the root or the the um, the root of that is seen or appreciated or mentioned or you know I think that needs to be highlighted in some way. Otherwise, it just looks like you know something's been stolen and then capitalized on. Mm -hmm. And that probably also feeds into a number of us. When we had our discussions last week, we talked about um, the the media, I mean, more the print publications as well. Not really. Um, it's all most predominantly Eurocentric designs that are showing up. Um, so part of that is is really addressing that as well, approaching print media. Because a lot of uh, that starts at a very young age. If you think of those of you who were really enamored with design at an early age, where did you start with the magazines, right? Now, social media too, but of course, but um, I think there's some work to be done there as well. Similar to our discussion earlier about HGTV and even as a center ourselves, we've, we've really have made that effort in our, we do a number of, we have student displays and windows and we have had artists, special guest artists. Uh, Grace Mia was one of them and, and our block party in February. Um, but we wanna see more of that, more everywhere. I guess more vendors and suppliers that, you know, focus on African, like pieces from Africa even directly, we can even go there. If, maybe if you guys are connecting more of those suppliers and vendors. So when we're sourcing, we're sourcing these fabrics. We're seeing more can exactly and take cloth, or we're seeing more certain things that are more inspired from Africa or even in the Caribbean or, you know, just throughout that. I think that's also a good way to make it seem more. Definitely a channel. Normal because it's already available in the center. Yeah. Well, we're at 12, almost at 1230. Wow, it went very fast. Would you like to do this again? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. So we'll regroup. <laughs> We've had some volunteers in the chat who want to be involved as well. We've had lots of thank yous and affirmations of, of the talk. Um, it's getting, Michael Lamby is saying right now, it's getting very interesting and he hates to have to jump off, but um, <laughs> he wants to be part of it next time. So that's great. Do you mind if I just say one thing before we jump off really quickly? Um, I just wanted to say, I, we, we are all, I, the collective, I, I think I can speak for everybody. I think at the end, when it comes to the goal of what we're trying to achieve, I think we'd like to get to a point where our work can just speak for itself, you know? I, like where we don't have to have these conversations where it's like, oh, this is the black interior design group. We're just being recognized because our work is is amazing. I think we're all artists at the end of the day. And I think, we would just like to have our work um, celebrated, not because we are, in, you know, everybody's talking about this and this is a conversation that's happening at this moment, but because we are, you know, just good. <laughs> the same way we don't, you know, in the magazine, in, in uh, House and Home magazine, for example, it doesn't say the white interior design um, group or month or whatever. We just like to right. be seen. <laughs> You know, so I think that's the goal that we're trying to reach where we can just be celebrated just because we're good. Yeah, absolutely. That's our, our vision. Okay, ladies, thank you very much. We really appreciate you being with us. Thank you to everyone who joined us. We have ideas for our next chats. We're all ears. And we'll see you then. You'll hear, you will, we will follow up. I, people have asked for your Instagram handles. So we'll share that with all the people who registered. If you're, I'm sure you're okay with that. <laughs> and, uh, well, thank you, TIDC, for having this panel and having us. I think it's a really important conversation. And hopefully we can continue the conversation and that it doesn't end here. We love and, to do that. And we can't Pleasure wait to do it in person, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have Thank a great day.
Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.